TOA community, what's up everybody? Welcome back to the channel, Robert Linkle, trainingtheolderadult.com. This is Wednesdays with Robert, episode 22. And we are gonna focus today on body types and talk about the three different kind of body types, or are there more? And how are they diagnosable? And what occurs if you are diagnosed as being a certain body type? And does that affect your BMI and your insurance and your health rate plans? and Everything else under the sun, so we're going to dive into all of that good stuff. I hope you are liking the new Wednesdays with Robert logo. Here's a couple of our other logos. We have our traditional TOA logo at the top, the workshop. That is our first weekend in November every single year workshop event that comes up now annually. We did these for a while, had to take a break during COVID. We just got back this last year. It's awesome. Our new Wednesdays with Robert and the bunker, as you see, hidden up here behind our plyo boxes, uh, as always. Uh, you'll see the, all those logos coming up together. Okay, let's dive into this here a little bit. Body types, okay, the body types. Typically, in almost every resource, and I'm going to show you about 20 of them, well, five, but within each of these resources, you are going to pretty much see the same thing. Ectomorph, mesomorph, endomorph. And then combos of endo, meso, ecto, meso, ecto, endo, et cetera, okay? And that's where some of the lines start to get a little blurred and, and all of this. Now, why is this important? Because someone will look at, let's, let's take uh, me, for example. Someone will look at me and go, endomorph, okay? Now, if you are labeled as something, then there's an expectation of, well, that's how you should eat, that's how you should train, that's how you should sleep, that's how you should recover, that's how you should yada, yada, yada. I'm not familiar with the yada, yada, yada research, but if there is some out there, you'll find it. Um, that's a Bones joke. Any fans out there of Bones and Booth? Great show. Anyhow, um, <laughs> not familiar with the yada. If you are classified as one of these, there's kind of like a criteria, and we're going to go through them here in a, mu a minute, of what and how you're supposed to do everything. But what if you don't fit necessarily into these, right? And we'll dive into that. Now, here's the other thing that kind of comes with this is a lot of these body types, they'll also have represented BMIs that they'll consider to be healthy or unhealthy. And based on, oh, it's a little blurry, sorry. Uh, based on that, that ability to fit into one of these categories, your BMI can have a pretty drastic effect on your health insurance and or being approved for uh, life insurance and, and all kinds of other um, effects necessarily on your health care. For an example of that too, I'm, I'm classified as an endomorph. That's the bigger, stockier individual that carries too much fat and has a hard time you know, putting on muscle or burning off fat, basically I can be a bigger frame and I will struggle to get really lean and skinny, okay? But on top of that, my bones are dense and I've built muscle into my body frame. And because of that, according to the BMI, I'm 6'3 and three quarter, almost 6'4. So I'm 6'3, let's just go with 6'3, 245 pounds. If you look at the BMI chart, that's not blurry, you'll be able to see that I am on the cusp of obese. So there's, there's under, there's normal, there's overweight, there's obese, and then there's morbidly obese, okay? I am on the cusp of obese to morbidly obese. And if you look at the categories in which those, individ, the, those falling into those categories are described, I am none of those, okay? I am none of those. And they're usually like girth measurement components and that. What they're not taking into effect is the amount of muscle that I've been able to build onto my body and the amount of density I've been able to put into my bones. And so the average 40 year old, 40 to 45 year old male, that's six foot three, is supposed to be 195 pounds or 193 pounds. So I am 45 to 50 pounds overweight slash over fat according to these categories. And so now if I go and try to apply for health insurance or life insurance, they're going to go, well, what's your BMI supposed to be and what are you? Well, here's the problem. We can't approve you or this premium is going to be really, really high because you're a risk. Okay. They don't look at my blood pressure. They don't look at my uh, blood work. They don't look at my musculature. They don't look at my body fat measurements. They don't look at my girth measurements. They don't really look at anything other than what the BMI says. 
Now, if you get a life insurance plan, a lot of times they'll come out and they'll do blood work and they'll do some measurements and it'll be better. But even then, in, in most of those cases, it's, they're not taking in the true account of, hey, I exercise seven days a week. I, you know, I eat really well. Like I put in all these efforts to make sure I'm taking care of my body. And because of this average chart, I am being you know, punished almost in the terms of not being able to qualify for the health care or the life insurance that I want. So there's always going to be some problems with BMI. And I think the best version to do this with is simply by looking at somebody's body fat percentage rather than their body mass index. Uh, body fats are harder to measure and a BMI is very simple to measure. Body fat measurements usually take time and or cost money. BMIs do not. So I see the convenience in wanting to do the other ones. Even a girth ratio, ratio of measuring your chest to your waist to your hips and or just your chest to your waist and giving a girth ratio there can give you some protocols on what is a healthy ratio and what is not and what would be classified as. I think those would be all better options than the BMI chart that we currently have, okay? So looking a little bit deeper into this, we see the endomorph, ectomorph, and the mesomorph, those three come up over and over and over again. I have not brought up an article from the company Curves before, and Curves is uh, a female-focused fitness facility, female-focused fitness facility, female-focused fitness facility, crushed it, uh, that it, it's very encouraging for women to come in and resistance train. And, and I love that. The only negative to it is it, it's about eight or nine pieces of equipment. They're exactly the same. They're in the same order and you do the same amount of reps or same amount of sets. Usually it's on a timer and you do it every other day or every day. And there really isn't a massive overload or struggle in this as you're doing the exact same thing pretty much every time. On occasion, some of them I've seen where they'll, they'll do 30 seconds one week and then 35 the next week, little linear progressions like that's good. You know, that's better than just doing the same thing every time. And then some will have little weight sets in there after and you could do some arm work and stuff like that. But again, usually those weights don't go over 10 pounds. So though it's a great entry step, I think there are more dynamic and athletic places that people could train. But if this is where we need to start, that's great. They've got this whole article here really outlining the body types and, and just kind of giving this same traditional answer that you're going to see that NASM gives and they're going to show the different body types and, and explain each of those and go into the more. So here you go. The endomorph, that's me, quote unquote. I'm not really, but this, that's what when you when you see a just a general like which one is Rob? When you look at those three, you're like that guy right there, the endomorph. Okay. Stockier and bone structure with a large midsection and hips. I, I mean, I carry more belly fat than I do anywhere else, but I don't have a large midsection and I don't have any hips. So that one, and I'm not stocky. So basically, if anything, I have bone structure, okay? Carries more fat throughout the body. Yeah. Uh, gains fat fast, loses it slowly. Yes, that's, that one is good. Naturally slow metabolism. Yeah, mine's okay. Mine's moderate potentially due to chronic conditions, thyroid deficiency, diabetes. Yep. Check, check. I don't have diabetes, but my entire family does. So, uh, probably, probably it'll be a struggle at some point. Uh, but too frequently, uh, the results of a sedentary lifestyle and chronically po and chronically positively daily energy balance. Uh, well that those last two are not the case. So, so keep that in mind, right? Medium bone structure with shoulder width with shoulders wider than their hips. Yes me as well. Developed athleticism um, and, and developed athletic uh, musculature. Yes. Um, effective metabolism and efficient metabolism, muscle gain and loss both happen with relative ease. No. So that's where I'm a true, I consider myself a meso endo, right? I think I'm a little bit more dominant of a mesomorph, but I have endo qualities as well. I'm probably 50, 50 on both of those, but because of the bone structure component, that's where I think I come into a meso a little bit more if I'm going to use this category to classify. Now, I'm going to give you at the end of this, we're going to go deep into it, so we're going to be here a little bit, but I'm going to give you a sliding scale that Dr. Mike Isretel um, from Renaissance is going to kind of show us a little component of that. And, and I'll, we'll, we'll talk about how you can classify a little bit more about what you're doing, but it still doesn't put these nice, neat little names on it at the end that kind of help us go, oh, this is what I am. 
And then you have the ectomorph, which is more narrow shoulders than their hips. Okay, so the shoulders narrow at the top, maybe a little bit more like a pear kind of shape. Relatively smaller muscles in, re in respect to bone length, so they're really lean and their musculature is not very big. Naturally, a fast metabolism makes it difficult for them to gain mass, fat, or muscle mass. Uh, and then potentially indicative of disorder eating and, um, and nor anorexia, bulimia, where their BMI is less than 17. So that, yes, it can lend towards the idea of having disorders, but just because you're an ectomorph doesn't mean that you have to be uh, or that you are going to develop an eating disorder. In um, Arnold Schwarzenegger's book, oh, by the way, I just got Arnold's new book. I just got it. My, my good buddy, John, got it for me, Be Useful. So that I just got, and uh, we'll be diving into this. And um, I, I like Arnold so much, and I love books. I love having the hard copy of a book, but do I personally have time to sit and flip through pages? No. So I, John bought me this, and then I went and bought the audio, and I'm going to listen to that while I ruck. But I love having these books, and I am more than happy to buy a book twice if it's someone that I support. So anyhow, Arnold's original you know, body book of uh, Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding. When you, when you look into those first couple chapters, excuse me, they do the same thing. They go through and they show different bodybuilders and they go, here's an ectomorph, here's an endomorph, here's a mesomorph. And so they're like mesomorph, Schwarzenegger, right? Uh, ectomorph, Frank Zane. And then you have your endomorphs, Lou Ferrigno. But then you have guys that are mixed kind of together in those bits. But you look at it and you're like, and Lou Ferrigno is not an endomorph. He's not stocky. You know, he's a bigger, thicker frame, but the guy was like 6'6 six, six or whatever, 6'5. So that's where some of these, it's like they don't fit perfect, okay? And, and as much as we want to be able to have one that's really nice and easy to classify, it's just not there. This one was a, a University of Harvard, I think, had some other information on here. Center for Wellness Without Borders. They had that on their website. Here's study.com. Uh, they go into the same thing, all those same different body types. Bodybuilding.com. Okay, they're diving into the body types here as well. What I thought was fun. Oh, let me go back to this real quick. What I thought was fun is almost all of them talk about this 1940s William Herbert Sheldon. Uh, the doctor who kind of classified these three categories and then talked about more consistent data that looked at, well, maybe it's not this easy to just classify into the three. And that's where this one, if you want to figure out what you are, I thought this quiz that went with this everyday health was actually pretty, pretty useful. It's going to give you one of these, but it also spit out like your, you know, 60% endomorph, 40% ectomorph, or something like that, right? It, it, like, it gave some combos in here. So um, it's, it's, it takes a little bit. It was pretty cool to, in the read, they go through and they want to talk about strengths and weaknesses and how you can design your workout programs or your fitness lifestyle around what these, these types are. But you got to figure out what it is. There's your 1940s correlation again that uh, Dr. Sheldon Okay, it goes into that a little bit. Training right for your body. This will be the right training in the weight room, the right recovery, the right way to eat, etc. I think one of the best options for this, by the way, is to have your blood work done. And your blood work can, and there, there are many different facilities. There's a couple here in Sacramento. Uh, there's, a, there's national ones you can go to. And the, in having your blood work done, they'll be able to tell you how your metabolism is how you metabolize sugars and fats and how you metabolize proteins and how you break down, how your body breaks down and when is the most efficient time for you to eat bigger meals versus smaller meals and what's the breakup of each of those meals and when should you eat them before or after training? Does your body respond well to cold or warm treatments, right? Or should you be, not everybody is designed to go into the polar plunge and do, you know, 40 degree uh, ice baths every day or every other day. Some people respond and do much better to warm environment saunas, right? I can't get my wife to get into cold water. She's miserable the entire time, does not feel this big dopamine rush and this excitement afterwards, hates every second of it. But you put her in a sauna, she'll sit in there for 20 minutes and feel amazing when she comes out. I am the exact opposite of that, the exact opposite. I get in the sauna, I get in there and I start to suffocate. I have a hard time breathing, I start to panic a little bit. I don't like being warm. I'm already a warm-blooded individual, so I start to like overheat while I'm in there. But you put me in the 
the cold plunge, I thrive. I do really well in that environment. I can manage that cold. And when I get out, I feel amazing. I think clearly. My body feels great. Like it's, it's more of a, a mental um, value for me than it is a physical, I need to ice my body to help it feel better kind of response. There's discussions on both ends of this, but definitely research to support like the dopamine rush and the mental clarity and the focus of your body and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's all, you know, relatively supportive and doing these ice, but not again, not for everybody. So having your blood work done can tell you a lot of that. So you're not just kind of guessing what it all is. I think that would be more beneficial than spending time trying to figure out what your body type is and then figuring from there and going, well, I guess this is as close to accurate as I can get. Let me try to do some of these things because some people's bodies respond really well to exercise first thing in the morning. Others later in the day or midday, others in the evening, right before they go to bed, even though almost every article you read, they'll say, don't exercise before you go to sleep. Everybody's body is different. Everyone's system and how they produce hormones and their hormonal responses are different. Everybody requires different amounts of sleep to recover and optimize their performance and how they do different food intakes, caloric intakes, caloric design and breakdown, all of this. Okay. So this will be a start, but I would say if you really want to figure out what is ideal for you, you're going to have to spend a couple hundred dollars and go in there and get blood work done and sit and chat with somebody and have them break it all down. But the cool part about this is that's going to tell you a lot. It'll tell you here are health concerns you have. Here are other you know, issues you need to work on. Your, um, I don't know, your cholesterol is high and your blood pressure is a little high. And maybe you didn't even know that. That's why you know, blood pressure and heart disease, it's called the silent killer is because you don't even know you have it. You, know? you don't even know you have it. And you, it's not like you have daily something that builds up, builds up, builds up. And you're like, I feel like I have something wrong with my heart. Just every day it gets a little bit worse. And until one day you, it's just over with. But for six months, your blood pressure has been 150 over 100. And you just didn't know that, right? I mean, that's a really high blood pressure. Anything over like 130 over 80 is is high. 120 over 70 is kind of ideal, right? So anything over that is high. I'll run up the flight of stairs and then sit in my doctor's office and I'll be 132 over 85. And they'll make me sit there for 10 minutes until my heart rate calms down enough and, and I can get a 125 out over 80 or something like that. And they go, okay, now we're good. But that, that is the, that is a, a huge indicator that there's something wrong. And that's just from blood pressure. Okay. Oxygenation level, resting heart rate, active. You could go and get a Bruce uh, protocol test, treadmill test done. You could have a Wingate test done. You could figure out your VO2 max. I mean, there's so many cool things that you could have done. There's testing labs all over the place. Invest some money if you really want to figure these things out. I luckily got to do a lot of this stuff in college. I was the test dummy in every class on how to do everything and anything. I was the only athlete in my class. So whenever there was something to be done, oh, Bruce, Pro Rob will do it. Rob will do it. Like I got volunteered to do every one. For me, I learned really well by doing something. So it was great for me to go through the process and go, yeah, I understand this. I felt that. I felt that. I didn't feel that. And, and it, it just made a lot more sense for me. Anyhow. Okay, here we go. So I'm not, I didn't put all the questions on here, but you can see, all right, from an objective point of view, which of the following factors seems uh, prominent or dominant in your body when you look in the mirror? Are you more bone? Are you more muscle? Are you more fat? And, and so that could be a tough one, right? So what if you answer that one wrong? Now everything else, you know, is kind of off. There's more questions to kind of give you some clarity in this. But again, having somebody else help you with this, I think would be better. If you look at your body, this was an old Arnold line in the, in the, in the day. He said, if you stand in, the, in, in front of the mirror naked, flex all your muscles and then jump up and down. Okay. If more of your body jiggles than is still, then your more of your body is fat than it is muscular, right? But if you squeeze and flex and you jump up and down and maybe just your sides wiggle around a little bit or your belly moves a little bit, then probably the majority of your body is, is bone. If you flex and you don't really see a whole lot of muscle, you're just seeing a whole lot of bone and there's no fat on you, then you're probably mostly bone, right? So you can try something like that in the comfort of your own home. Make sure the blinds are close. So you're not giving the neighbors a a show and they're like, what the hell is that guy doing? Like non-active jumping jacks? What's, go <laughs> what's going on in here? Uh, just to kind of give you an idea, okay, which direction to go. And there's a whole bunch of other ones, you know, the, do you look more like a pencil, an hourglass or a pear, blah, 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 right? They go through all 10 of these. 
And then at the end, they go, okay, which one did you think you were? And then they give you a little score on how to kind of go through it all. And then at the end, they go, okay, here are the body types. And so they start with the ectomorph and they go into the mesomorph. They discuss that and give you some more descriptions. And they go into the endomorph and they talk about that one a little bit more. And then at the end, they go, you know, there are such things as ectomesos and you have your mesoendos and then you have your ectoendos which are pretty rare but they they do occur and that'll give you a little bit more detail slash emphasis on which one of these you might fall into okay so i think it's a good thing to have an idea a general idea of where you fall what i like about this particular picture is it doesn't change anyone's height necessarily. It's truly based on their build. So if you looked at these individuals and you said, where would I fall into the frame? You, me, any of us. You should be able to look at that and go, well, it's not about being tall or short. It's more about, am I kind of a railed, thinner individual that struggles to put on any kind of mass? Am I kind of like a natural build and I don't really have a hard time going up or down? Or am I a little bit thicker, bigger framed individual and it's kind of hard for me to lose any kind of mass, you know, but uh, a tiny bit of a struggle to put it on. I, I feel like this one is probably the closest version that you could kind of throw out for the general individual and they would go, okay, this, I think I can fall into one of these or a mixture of one of these um, you know, relatively well. Now, when, when you hear like the combos of each one, you're like, how is there an endo ectomorph? How would that come together? That's when they start looking at the, the, your stout, you know, your five, two, but your 200 pounds, that's a stout individual probably has big bone density. Right. But what if you're five, two and you're stout, but you're, you also don't have a whole lot of muscle mass, but you're not fat either right? You're just kind of a, a, an ability individual that's a little bit smaller and still semi-thick, like not very common, right? I, I can't even envision, but there are potential opportunities to have mixtures of each of these, okay? That's my point. Anyhow, all right, so here's Dr. Mike's. This, this is a screen grab from his YouTube video while he's presenting it and talking about it. So he's doing, he's doing this. Oops. I thought I had a picture of him there. There was one more and one more where he, uh, he's like on screen and he's talking kind of like I'm doing right now and discussing this, but his, his thought process was this, which I thought was, was cool. But again, it doesn't leave you with, well, I'm a fill in the blank. Here's the classification. He, he kind of gives a little bit of that. Number one, he said, let's look at an individual that is either thin boned or thick boned. And the only way you would know that is by having a bone scan done, which can be done usually in the places you're getting blood work done. Okay. Uh, it, some places they only do bone scans and other places only do blood work, but most of the time they'll do both. So you can figure out, am I a thicker bone density? So on a, uh, I found, I learned this the other day from one of our subscribers, by the way, what the Z and the T scores mean when you're looking at bone densities and all that. I would have to reread exactly what they put on there, but um, it was very good information and kind of explaining how these numbers represent certain percentages of the, of the population that, that are, are around the same. And, and so that creates the, the base layers, right? The means, if you will, across there. So basically you're on a, like a three to three scale, a three positive or a zero and then three into the negative, okay? And if your bone density is, is, is low, meaning you have osteopenia or osteoporosis, does it necessarily mean that you're not a big boned or a small bone person? I mean, kinda. The, the idea is that if you have more bone density, you'll have bigger, thicker, stronger bones. There can be some small framed individuals, some ectomorphs, if you will, that lift weights and they run and they do all kinds of high impact activities and their bones are dense as shit. And that's, that's totally good. That's a very acceptable thing. And that's what we want you to have. Right. But I wouldn't call you stocky. So that's where, again, another example of why we can't just classify people based on those three, because you can have, you know, multiple different options with this. So are you thin boned or are you thick boned? At the same time, do you have a high amount of muscle mass or a low amount of muscle mass? And 
that typically can kind of be seen by the naked eye, but again, you need to have some type of measurement done with a bod pod or you know a, a water submersion tank where you let all your air out and you submerge, and it gives you a breakdown of your body fat percentage. Now, it's going to tell you how much fat you are. It's going to tell you how much uh, lean muscle mass you are and then overall mass that you are. So it'll look at that and go, 20% uh, of your body is fat, 80% of the rest of your body is muscle, bone or organ, okay? And then out of that 80%, it'll say 50% um, is muscle. Uh, that might be a little high, 40% is muscle, okay? And so the other 40% would then be bone and organ. And so you could look at that and go, okay, I've got a 20% body fat, which isn't, isn't bad. That's, that's you know, a, little, a tiny bit high for, uh, for guys, a little higher for women. Guys typically want to be around 18, I think. Women want to be around 16, or, or I haven't looked at a body fat chart in a long time, to be honest. I, don't, I personally don't give a damn about it at all. Uh, even though I've talked about that being the classifier for this, I am such a fan of, here's where I am. I have lost body fat. My jeans and my clothes fit better and I feel great about how I look, then we're winning. If you're needing to buy you know, some winter clothes that are a size bigger, then we're probably losing. We need to make some changes. The, the numbers that go on it, I gave all that up. My obsessive years of being a bodybuilder and wanting to try to get down to 6%, down to 5%, like all of this madness that I went through, I was obsessed with all these numbers. And so at this point in my life, I'm like, I don't even care. I stepped on the scale the first time today so I could talk to you about what I actually was. And that's the first time I've been on one in three or four months. Uh, John and Chris and I are clients here. We all measure, weigh in like every couple of months just to see where we're at. And, and But again, I don't care. As long as the clothing that I'm wearing is, is fitting me good and I like the way I'm looking, then I am a happy camper. I encourage you to do the same, okay? But based on what we want to look like, we need to look at this and be able to assess, are we more muscular? Are we a little bit more fat or under-muscled? And let's make some changes. In a lot of cases, a bod pod, it's this little pod that you sit in and they pressurize it somehow. And I, again, I don't know how they work exactly. So if that's wrong, please don't hold me to it. Somehow you sit in this, you sit in there for like a minute or two, and then it spits out it says, here's your hydration level, here's your body fat, here's your lean muscle mass, here's your bone density. It gives you all this whole report, pages of all this information by just sitting in this thing for a couple of minutes. And then it spits out and tells you, and it's fairly accurate from what I understand. Bod pods are really, really good. They were popular and big 10 to 15 years ago. They're even more efficient and successful now. I think they're smaller and they're cheaper and they're more mobile. And you can go and get one of these done relatively easy and quickly and inexpensively and get some really good information that would answer all these questions. Then they look at adipose, adipose tissue and what kind of bone, excuse me, what kind of fat you are carrying, separating that out from, again from the bone and the muscle mass, how much body fat am I carrying and what type of body fat, uh, what kind of adipose tissue are you uh, accruing? And that could be from your regular uh, body fat to brown fat, et cetera. There's, again, that goes down a whole nother channel. We can talk about that later, okay? So once you kind of find out where you are on this sliding scale of, do I have thin or thick bones, high or low muscle mass, high or low body fat? Once you have answers to all of that, then you can start to decide, or whoever you're working with can start to decide how to build the training program to get you the goals that you want. Let's say we are under boned, under muscled, and under fat. So you're under on everything. I'm gonna encourage you to start eating more, start lifting harder, right? And start building some more muscle mass. And in that eating, I want you to eat really good, clean stuff, but a lot of it. So you can start to put on some mass to your body, but not necessarily a lot of body fat. But if they're under body fat, then we may even want to overcalorically uh, intake on, on these individuals to help them get into a healthier body fat. Does that mean Snickers and candy bars and pizzas and all that? Not, not all the time, no, not, not a whole lot really at all. But it does mean that we can add in some foods that will help this individual put on more fat. But on the other side, if you're overly thick boned or just highly thick boned, good. What if you have a lot of muscle? That's great. What if you have a lot of fat? Maybe that's not the look that you're going for, okay? Maybe you look like a world strongman. And if you're training the sport of world strongman, that's awesome. Those individuals are strong, they're athletic, they're super thick boned, but they also carry a lot of fat because the more mass they are, the more mass they can move, right? There's a lot of guys out there that are 350 pounds 
and they're so strong. And they compete against Brian Shaw or Zydrunas Savickas, and these guys are 400 pounds. They'll lose almost every single time because the bigger mass moves more mass. So unless it's an agility-based lift or a, a timed sprint, it's kind of a care or something, but even then, the bigger mass can sometimes move that mass more. And there's an advantage component to being that big. But is that what we want as individuals? I want something kind of right down the middle, a kind of moderate to slightly low body fat, right? We want to be right around that 20% body fat, maybe a little lower, a little higher, somewhere right around in there. Now that I'm thinking about it, it's like 20, God, I want to say women are like 18 to 24 and men are 16 to 20, something like that on body fat. The ladies, the closer they get to like 17 or 16, you start having more deficiencies with your body if your body fat percentage isn't high enough. So that's why it's a little higher on the ladies end, okay? And then I would like muscularity to be a little bit higher on the other end of this. So let's look at things right down the middle, okay? From let's call this a zero to 10 scale. Let's do fives on everything. Bone density, I want you up near a nine or a 10. Musculature, six, seven, eight. Adipose tissue, body fat, two, three, four, three, four, somewhere that way, right? So we want body fat a little bit lower. We want musculature a little higher. We want bone density as high as we can get it, okay? That's kind of the target for most people out there. I would, but if you, you have goals of, I want to be a, you know, a physique individual, or I want to be a distance runner, or I want to play football, or I want to retire and be capable of doing all the things that I want to do, all different training philosophies, but ultimately it'll be, don't carry too much excess body fat, get more muscle than being under muscled and try to make your bones as dense as possible. I think that's going to cover almost all individuals that we are going to encounter. So how do we do that? That's where the coach comes in and building the programs and assisting. And we've been working with a couple of different professionals out there to help us with using some apps, but also personal coaching to help get nutrition where they want it. Because nutrition is not an area of expertise for me. So I refer that to somebody else, just like doing physical therapy. I send to Dan. We have a behavioral counselor. We have a coach for that. Like we, we have different experts for different realms and we're in. But when it comes to building muscle mass, getting strong, getting more capable, able, fighting frailty, circle P, I'm the guy. Send them to me. I'm that member of the team. I'm that, that spoke in the wheel, that cog in the wheel. I'm that individual that brings that component into it. And that's, if you're listening to me, you're either that individual too, or you're seeking an individual that can provide you that information. And that is our intention with discussions like this is allowing you to find out where are you on these scales? What specifically should you be working on? But also being semi-aware if someone looks at you and goes, you're a little bit uh, ecto-mezzo, aren't you? You're going to know what the hell they're talking about and, and be able to go, I take offense to that. By no means am I skinny and frail and you know, do my hips outmeasure my shoulders, young man. Uh, I am in fact a mezzo-endo as I am quite dense and <laughs> my shoulders are wider than my hips, et cetera, et cetera, whatever, right? You, you'll have an understanding. And that's what we always want for everybody is, I call it a place at the table. If you're gonna sit at a table with experts in every little area of our profession or in any profession, You'd want to know at least the basics of what everyone's talking about so you can keep your place at the table. And discussions like this, I, I hope, and bring light and some ed education and some, um, some depth to understanding what the body types are and where most people are still using those, where Dr. Mike is like, maybe we should get away from that and just focus on these things and see if this person is under or over on these three categories. And there's all kinds of different options from there on what to do with them. I think ultimately we're trying to funnel down and find some answers to teach people how to train, what's most efficient and effective for them to train that way and how can they get the results that they want. All right, any comments or questions, feel free to hit me up in the comment section below. Remember, our TOA affiliate program is always on the grow. We've opened up a couple of new spots. We've had some individuals that have graduated and moved on, and they're now kind of re referring back into a mentoring program with us where we still meet with them and do this, but that frees up hours where we can do full affiliate programs and start to bring in more folks. We have more junior hours that have opened. We have more private mentoring hours that have opened. So if you have passion and effort and, and want to get better at working with older populations and be able to grow your business and grow your expertise and working with this realm and you need some assistance, head over to trainingtheolderadult.com, click on the affiliate link and check out all of our information there. 
Uh, we have some really great events and some new courses and certifications coming out in 2024. We have our holiday workouts all coming up, this being the day before uh, Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to all of you. And I wanted to say thank you for being here and being a part of the channel and our community and helping us grow. If you don't mind hitting that subscribe button, ringing the bell, and then liking the video, that would really help us quite a bit. If you ever want to leave comments, that always helps boost things, help us grow this channel. We would really appreciate it. From all of us here at TOA, my wife, my kids, our whole family, our whole community, all of you, happy holidays, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. We love and appreciate you all. Continue to fight your good fight against Sargopenia. We'll see you in the next one. Peace.